reading is from Jude chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are the called, loved by God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I find it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. For some people who were designated for the judgment long ago have come in by stealth. They are ungodly, turning the grace of God into sensuality and denying Jesus Christ, our only master and Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Kuyomora Dumela Saobona Heita. Thank you, church. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ as an elder of Fellowship City. This morning, I have the privilege of sharing the word of God uh, with you. We're starting, or we're in a new series um, in the book of Jude. This is a lesser-known book, which is a single chapter of, of 25 verse, verses, but we will be um, spending three weeks in this chapter. If you don't know where it is, it is the second last book in the Bible, so you have to go all the way um, to the back or scroll to the bottom of your digital device just before Revelations. It will be a single page, so you might miss it as you try to find it in your Bible. The book, as we will experience, encourages the reader to remain in Christ, to contend for the faith by sharing some truths about the Christian faith as well as examples about the faith that should give us the courage to contend for the faith. There are also examples in history as warnings about what happens if you don't remain in the faith in this book. Jude then ends with steps at the, at, at the, at, at the last part of Jude on how we can build up our faith, and we will see that in the last few verses of Jude. Let's pray as we get into God's word this morning. Lord, we thank you that this morning we can come together as your people and sit under your word. I pray that this morning that you would remove all the distractions, all the things that are waging war for our minds and our hearts, um, all the things that are to come uh, in, the, in the day to, to come, all the week to come. We pray that you would help us to focus on you, um, to hear the Holy Spirit speak, um, to hear you speak through my vocal cords. And I pray that um, you would enable your people to hear your voice. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, the title of the sermon is A Faith That Slaps. So slaps for the older folk does not always mean an open-handed, five-finger rebuke across the face. But slaps can also mean something that is so, so good, something that is great, um, much like a slow-cooked or smoked pork or that, that beat while we were um, singing our God. Or like this morning, a faith that is so good. Um, so our title is A Faith That Slaps. The Matrix is a movie franchise. Um, I know some were expecting me to say that it slaps, but I will leave that one up to you. So The Matrix is a movie franchise that shows people who live in an alternate uh, reality. Sometimes they find it hard to understand which reality they live in. The characters of The Matrix are living in a false reality. They are presented with a pill that supposedly introduces them to the truth. Once the spill is taken, then they awaken to this new world. And we can see a scene where Morpheus and Neo are sitting, and the spill is being presented to Neo. So all the, all the people who aren't in this new world are then stuck in this reality, this false reality. They are deceived, and that is a sense we get when we think about the greater theme of the Matrix. So Jude warns against deception and people who are trying to lead others astray people who are taking the gospel and adding to it to fit their own passions and desires, people perverting the grace of God to allow them to sin and reject the authority of Jesus. That is what we will see in the book of Jude. But then Jude encourages those who have been awakened to the truth, those who have their faith in Christ, to remain in the truth, to contend for the faith, to contend for faith. So four points this morning as we navigate the text. We'll look at who Jude is because we're going to spend three weeks in there. I think it's important that we know who Jude is. We'll look at God and faith, and we'll look at what it means to contend for the faith, and we'll look at our response to that contending for the faith. So who's Jude? The first verse and first words in the book of Jude tell us who wrote the book. Jude. 
The first verse also tells us who Jude is. A servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. The name Jude is derived from the name Judas, so we know the full name of the writer as Judas, and short for Judas would be Jude. There are a few people identified as Judas. One is Judas Iscariot, who is one of the disciples of Jesus, who betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, then ultimately hangs himself. That's one Judas we, we get from the Bible. And then we have Judas um, the Great, who is also a disciple of, of Jesus. So there are two Judases who are part of the disciples of Jesus. Then there's a Judas who is the brother of Jesus. We see this in Mark 6, verse 3. Bible Lamliti. Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters here with us? So they were off- offended by him. So Jesus had four brothers, as we see here. James was one of those brothers. Jesus' brothers didn't believe in his identity as the son of God at first. You can see where they might have come from if you were to ask yourself what it would take for you to believe that your brother was God. So they grew up with Jesus and would not believe who he is. We see this again in Mark 3, verse 21. They believed that he was out of his mind. So James and Judas had to believe him when they experienced the evidence for themselves. Jude saw Jesus beaten and bruised, Jesus nailed to the cross, and Jesus buried in a tomb. Jude then sees the empty tomb and Jesus alive. This is enough to change his belief and faith in Jesus as the Son of God. So Jude and James then become the elders or leaders in the early church from people who didn't originally believe in Jesus. So in verse 1, Jude writes with humility in acknowledging Jesus as king and God by introducing himself as a servant of Jesus but a brother of James, even though he is a brother of Jesus. The amazing thing is, much like Jude and James, who didn't believe in Jesus until they experienced the truth of the resurrection, if we have experienced the same truth of the resurrection and have believed in Jesus Christ as Savior and God, then we also are brothers of Jesus. Jesus is our brother. So Jude is writing to the church. He is writing to those who are believers in Christ. He's specifically writing to his church, which is a Jewish church in Jerusalem. However, as we read this letter we can see that he's writing to us also. To those who are, the, who are called, loved by God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So then this letter is relevant to us because we are called, we are loved, and kept for Jesus Christ if we have put our faith and trust in him. Just a quick side road, as we still consider who Jude is, Jude loves to write in triplets. He started this in verse 1, if you didn't already see it. He identifies himself in three ways, as Jude, servant of Jesus, and brother of James. In verse 2, he shares three other actions that happen from God, called, loved, kept. In verse 2, he also gives three blessings to those who are in God, saying mercy, peace, and love for those who are called. And there are many more triplets we will see and experience over the next two weeks And so the second set of triplets in verse 1 are called, loved, and kept. So as we move on to our second point this morning, God and faith, we will see these three triplets, called, loved, and kept. These are passive words because the action is in God and not us. So Jude starts by pointing out the security we should have in God. Our security is based on actions that God takes. God calls God loves and God keeps us in Christ. This is the start of the letter. In chapter 24, the end of the letter, we read, Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy, to the one, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. So God is able to keep or protect us. So Jude starts and ends the letter with actions from God. And we'll see at the end there's also attributes of God that's in triplet form. So if we have lovers of carbs sitting here, they would know that a patty, cheese, egg, and all the essentials of a burger like a caramelized onion are safe between two buns. (laughs) Much the same as we are safe in what God does. 
In the beginning of the letter, he calls, he loves, and he keeps us. At the end, it speaks about his identity and him keeping us in Christ. The triplets is he presents us without fault in verse 24. Keeps us from falling in verse 24. And has great joy, which are the attributes of God. That is the last analogy for food this morning, I promise. <laughs> so fam, I don't, want, I don't want us to miss what Jude is saying here. We are called by God to be loved and kept for Jesus. So our first calling is being called into being loved It has been called to be loved by Jesus. It is, in, it is into being a child of God, a brother of Jesus. Before we are called for works or called for doing anything else, we are called to be loved by God. So this is such great news. We don't have to perform. We don't have to wonder. We have to see that we are called by God for God. We are children of God before we are servants of God. We saw this last week when we looked at God as Father. This calling by God is what gives us confidence in Him. If we are to stand before the door of heaven and knock, if we are asked who we are, we don't have to remember all that we did in our past. We don't have to pull out our qualifications, our biography, our picture album. We can boldly say, I'm with Jesus. That is the level of name dropping we have in God because He calls us. So our first calling is being called into being loved by God. His love is what transforms us, transforms our hearts to love him and for the works he calls us to. That's our faith, faith in God because of what God has done on the cross for us. Faith in the love of God, that's a faith that slaps. This is like what we said last week. We have our identity as sons and daughters of the Most High God before we can think of our duty as sons and daughters. We can't love God in and of ourselves. We love God because he loves us and his love transforms our hearts. We will see how this happens in verse 24. Fam, we are loved more than we can imagine. When we are most hard to love, when we fail, when we excel, when we're filled with remorse or guilt, when we're filled with despair or anxiety, even when we doubt we are loved, God still loves us. What does kept for Christ mean? Kept for Christ refers to the second coming of Christ. Those who are called by God, loved by God, are also kept for the returning of the second coming of Christ. We see this sentiment in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23, which says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful he will do it. We are being kept for the ultimate return of Jesus so that we can reign with him when he returns. The second form or second set of triplets is may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So why does Jude write this here? What's the importance of this verse? I think there's great importance. It is both a reminder and an encouragement. The calling, love, and keeping for Jesus Christ brings out the mercy, peace, and love. We need mercy. We were once like Jude and James before they built their faith in Jesus. We once disobeyed God and needed a Savior, but God called, loved, and showed us mercy. We deserve punishment for our sins, but God showed us mercy. This mercy brings peace. As sons and daughters of God adopted into his family, we have peace. We can come to the Father as he is and ask of him. We know he loves us because God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. Out of the love of God, we can only then love God because he is love and he loves us. Contending for the faith. Dear friends, although, this is what Jude says, dear friends, although I was eager to write you about the salvation we share, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. Verse 3 of Jude is the main hook or the main verse of the entire book. Jude had to change the subject of his letter to address specific issues within the church and to encourage, no, actually to appeal to the readers to contend for the faith. Jude here is trying to help the reader to not rest on their laurels. Just because we have confidence, because God calls us, loves us, and keeps us, and because God builds us up, doesn't mean we have to be passive. 
We should fight for the gospel. We should contend for the faith. We should appreciate. We should be in awe of this faith that slaps. What is this faith? This faith is the way of righteousness. The faith is related to eternal life, which we are called to. This is why this faith slaps, because it is because of God, by God, and through God. 1 Timothy 6, uh, verse 12 to, 20, uh, to 16 says, Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called about, which you have made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God who gives life to all and of Christ Jesus who gave a good confession be- before Pontius Pilate. I charge you to keep this command without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. God will bring this about in his own time. He is the blessed and only Savior, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in an approachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal power. So this faith is a relationship with God. It has been called by God, confessing into a family of God, receiving a new life and identity in God. This faith is in the return of Jesus Christ because we have experienced his resurrection through disciples and prophets who have wrote many letters. So God calls us into this faith because we are separated from a holy God because of sin. But God establishes his faith in Jesus, in his death, his resurrection, and his ultimate return. Faith is not only the idea of God, but it is a relationship with God. So verse 3b says, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. The truth about the gospel, about Jesus, is preserved and passed down in teaching. Once and for all means and refers to the truth about the gospel being final and unchanging. There is no new revelation. In context, this means the false teachers can't bring new revelation. That is what Jude is saying, because the false teachers were bringing new ideas to comfort and lead others astray into sin. The Bible has taught um, from the, the prophets and, and, and apostles and elders is the complete word of God. We should not add to it and we should not use it. We should use it faithfully. What does it mean to contend for this faith? The Greek word used here is apagnosimai, which better explained would be like a, an athlete. This is the Comrades Madison Marathon. You'll see a picture of the Comrades Madison. It's an, it's an intensely physical run or competition. 90 kilometers putting your body through the pain. So this word, apangnozimai, is closer to an extreme intense effort in a physical competition. This is significant because Jude is, Jude is saying here that to contend for the faith is hard, it's physical. And, and in context, this is because some people would die for this faith. This faith that is so good, this faith that is from God, this faith we are called to, this faith that slaps. This faith that was shared by the prophets and apostles and elders has opposition, and we ought to fight for this faith against those who seek to pervert this faith. Pervert meaning to take something that, that was good and making it bad or worse than it was. Just a quick side road, Jude didn't just write Uh, that he wanted to write about salvation for no reason, but it is because the salvation is at stake. If we don't contend for the faith, the apostles were willing to lose their lives for this gospel, for this faith, because they believed in the power of the gospel, but also wanted to preserve the message of the gospel and what they stood for. If we don't contend for the faith, we water down our witness, and we in turn damage or neglect the faith. There is a new series called Swagger on, on Apple TV that loosely portrays the life of Kevin Durant, who is a, a basketball star and was a promising basketball player in his youth. So Swagger portrays O'Shea Jackson, the son of Ice Cube, as a coach. So the coach has and shares this term with the lead actor, Jace, uh, who's depicting um, Kevin Durant. He shares this term of a 24-hour person. He uses this term to describe dependability, availability, and saying that he, the coach, believes and is a 24-hour person, a person that you can depend on, that is available, that you can trust, who stands up and leads. We should contend for the faith like a 24-hour person, out of what we believe about this faith, this faith that is so good, this faith that is from God. He calls us, he loves us, and he keeps us in that faith. 
We ought to contend for this faith like an athlete, knowing that it is hard, but keeping true to it at all times, not just on a Sunday morning or afternoon, but on Blue Monday, on Puza Thursday, or Friday, Friday. Against what should we be contending for the faith? Jude uses another uh, form of triplets. There are people who are set for judgment. That's the first one. They are set for judgment because they disobey the word of God. We see this in 1 Peter 2 verse 8. They stumble because they disobey the word of God. They were destined for this. They were destined for this judgment because they disobey the word of God. So they're set for judgment and they're sneaky as they come in stealth. So 2 Timothy 3 verse 6 says, For among them are those who worm their way into households and deceive gullible women, overwhelming, overwhelmed, by, overwhelmed by sin and led astray by a variety of passions. So they come in by stealth, unknowing to the people to deceive the people. So the people are set for judgment, they come in stealth, and lastly they are not ungodly. They don't obey God. They obey, they obey their own evil desires. In context, there were people in the church who wanted to live by their own desires, who wanted to not only have banquets, but have sexual relations with whoever they wanted to, satisfying their own passions, turning the grace of our God into sexuality and denying Jesus Christ. These people were people who were part of the church. Sometimes, if we don't contend for the faith, if we remain in sin, we pervert the faith, and we too are like the people who are deceivers in this context. The worst enemies or detractors of the faith are some of those who profess faith. So stats from the World Population Review puts Christianity at 90% of the population of Lesotho and Namibia, 87% of the population of Zimbabwe, 79.8% of the population of South Africa, and 71% of the population of Botswana. So if the majority of Christians are not contending for the faith, if the majority of Christians are not 24-hour people, if they are ungodly, then they're, per, then they're perverting the, the faith. Jesus Christ is our only master and Lord, is the end of verse 4. We should not be slaves to our own selfish desires or sin. We should contend for the faith, because this faith is so good, and this is a faith that's brought by God. Our last point, our response. In what ways can we be a 24-hour person in the faith? In what ways can we contend for this faith? How do we respond to this faith that slaps, to Jude who is appealing to us to contend for this faith? We need to contend in our minds. We should be aware of what we feed our, our minds. What is captivating our minds? Is it God or is it the things of the world? If you check your phone's most used apps, what does it tell you? If you check the thoughts of your mind, what is in there? Even as we sit here this morning, what is fighting for your mind? So we need to contend in our mind. We need to contend in our households. Whether you are single, engaged, married, or married with kids, what do you do in your space? If someone came in, what would they think is important to you? If you have a wife and kids, are you raising them up in the Lord? If you're a wife, are you raising the kids and teaching the kids the ways of God? We need to contend in the workplace. Do you live a life that reflects your faith in the workplace? Three last points as we end. I think building up our faith is one of the ways to build up. Uh, one of the ways to build up our faith is to, to, to pursue our spiritual growth, which is by reading the Bible regularly and richly. It is studying the Word of God. Sometimes we choose to study other things, our big new hobby, our passions, more than the Bible itself. We sometimes don't have priorities are straight. We should ask ourselves, is Christ first in all things? Are we spending time reading the Word of God regularly? Is the Word of God transforming us inside out? The Word of God is useful for teaching, training, rebuking, and correcting. That's what we see in Timothy. Are we letting the Word of God dwell richly in us? Are we living in community? Because that's also a great way to live. Do you have other trusted brothers and sisters doing life with you? Maybe even encouraging and reading the Bible with you. Teaching, training, rebuking, and correcting. Sometimes we don't quite see and appreciate the value of this, but we see it in Acts 2, verse 42 to 45. We see that we're meant to be in community. This is not only on a Sunday, but regularly outside of Sunday. 
We should be breaking bread, praying, fellowship, and devoted to the word of God. This isn't a nice-to-have family. It is a must, and it must be more important than all other things. Praying in the Holy Spirit, we will see as well, is a good way for us to contend in the faith. Are we hearing and yielding to the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit dwelling in us or just a visitor we keep in the corner of our hearts? We ought to pray regularly. We ought to be receptive to how the Holy Spirit speaks to us, how the Holy Spirit warns us about the things that are fighting for our affections and heart, things that keep us further from God, things that are trying to deceive us. The last one, keeping in Jesus' love. Are we obedient to the word of God? Do we know it? Are we obedient? The deceivers were not obedient. They chose to live in sin. We may not have the exact same struggles, but we will see next week and the week after that the similar struggles that are contending for our hearts and minds. Similar struggles that we go through that are contending for our hearts and minds. But to contend for the faith, we should be obedient to God. We should live by faith. We should consume the word of God so that we are captivated by his word rather than captivated by the things of the world which desire to keep us from God. There is a faith we should contend for, a faith that is authored by God because God calls, loves, and keeps us for Christ. To contend for this faith, we should be a 24-hour person for the faith. We should build up our faith in the word of God. We should pray and listen to the Holy Spirit at work in us, and we should keep in the love of God by being obedient to God and letting God captivate our hearts. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that this morning we can come to you and we can ask for you to do and continue a mighty work within our hearts. I pray that you would enable us to contend for the faith, to keep us true and keep our eyes fixed on you. Where we fall astray or where we have things waging war for our hearts and minds, we pray that by the work of the Holy Spirit, that you would enable us to draw closer to yourself. We pray that we can sing, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders, and that we would yield to the work of the Holy Spirit in us. We pray that you would make us brave to contend for the faith. We pray that you would speak to our hearts those things that you'd want us to know, to say, and to do. And we pray that we may be in awe of this faith that is from you, Lord God. For you call us, you love us, and you keep us in Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.